to all my friends out there on the internet. It is good to be here and I've got a great topic for us tonight. But um, before we get started, <clears throat> I'd like to draw attention to this magnificent t-shirt that I am wearing. This, my friends, is the sacred garb, the vestment, if you will, of Lambda Lambda Lambda, the greatest fraternity on the face of the earth. So, I'd like to send a very fond shout out to all the brothers, all the chapters, all the pledges across the country and the world. If you guys are watching this, I'd like to raise my fermented horse milk and ask you to join me in a toast. Follow the 12, we are the bears, and remember, never stack the lambdas. Here's to our brotherhood. Stay awesome, and don't forget that everyone is getting represented in Mongolia. Cheers, brothers! Mmm! Oh, that is always such an interesting taste. Anyway, uh, let's move on to our main topic for the evening. So, first of all, I'd like to send another shout-out to my friend Thomas Morgan, who's been having a really cool conversation with me these last few days about ancient Yenizaic speakers, and has gotten me interested in making some more videos. So anyway, a few months ago, you know, I made a video about the Jie, and they were a possibly Yenizaic-speaking tribe who founded a short-lived imperial dynasty in northern China. And I'd like to tell their story today. And it's one which I hope that you will agree is as dramatic as anything you would see on TV or in a movie or what are they, whatever they have these days. So, please sit back and relax, pour yourself some fermented horse milk, and get ready for the epic story of the Jie. So, the place is China. The time is 3rd century CE. It was a time of chaos and savagery. The great Han Dynasty, which for centuries had ruled all under heaven, had fallen to internal strife and outside invasions. In its place emerged three kingdoms struggling for power. In the south, stretching from the Yangtze River to modern Vietnam, was the kingdom of Wu, led by the patient, diplomatically gifted Sun Quan. By the way, I'm mangling the tones on these Chinese names, so to all my uh, Chinese friends out there, I apologize. In the north, bordering the steppe tribes of the Xiongnu, was the kingdom of Wei. And although Wei was nominally led by the Han Emperor, the reins of power were tightly gripped by the cruel and devilishly clever prime minister named Cao Cao. And, uh, th th sorry, again, there's a word that sounds just like that, that it's actually a bad word in China, in Chinese, so uh, please don't get angry at me. Sorry. Doibuchi. Okay. In the west, and that is modern-day Sichuan province, was the kingdom of Shu, not to be confused with the ancient kingdom of Shu of the uh, second millennium BC, but this was a, a later kingdom that used the same name. And this kingdom was led by the imperial scion Liu Bei, and, and Liu Bei struggled to rescue the emperor from his captivity and restore the Han Empire to its former glory. After decades of civil war, a new dynasty known as the Great Jin arose from the ashes of Wei and conquered all of the other kingdoms. Now, this is, this is a very complex period of history, and it, my description doesn't really do it justice. But uh, you can read about it in... The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is actually one of my favorite books. And uh, I, I only talk about this today because this period forms the backdrop of today's story. So, let's look at the Jin Dynasty. The Jin Dynasty ruled all of China during the 3rd century, but its power was not to last. Because by the beginning of the 4th century, northern China had collapsed and fallen into a, the, the possession of the nomadic tribes to the north. These tribes were known as the Xiongnu, and uh, as we discussed before, Xiong it has a very similar sound to the, uh, the name that the, the Latin speakers of ancient Rome had, the Huns. So were they the same people? Were they related? Maybe. We don't know. But anyway, these Xiongnu, known in Mongolia even as the Hunnu, they set up their own pseudo-Chinese dynasties. They acted Chinese, they used literary Chinese, but they actually themselves were not Chinese. And this is kind of the same system that's actually been repeated throughout Chinese history. 
the Mongols did the same thing with the Yuan dynasty, and the Manchu did the same thing with the Qing dynasty. And this, of course, lasted even into the 20th century. Meanwhile, so let's, I'm sorry, let's go back. The Jin have fallen to these conquest dynasties of the nomadic tribes, and they retreated south of the Yangtze, where they would remain for another century. And one of these Xiongnu tribes referred to themselves as the Han Chao. And this is a name that referred to the ancestry of their leader, because he claimed descent from the Han dynasty through his maternal line. No, through, through a Han dynasty princess who had been married to a Xiongnu chief. And uh, he even claimed that he was a descendant of Da Yu, or uh, Yu the Great, who was uh, kind of the Chinese King Arthur, supposedly started the Xia dynasty of the 3rd century, I'm sorry, 3rd millennium BC. So anyway, there's this guy making up these claims of his origins, and he went even so far as to change his family name to that of the Han emperors, that was Liu. And uh, this is kind of building up legitimacy for himself. So he claims the imperial throne of China, despite the reality of just being a minor step warlord. In order to expand his empire throughout China, this uh, emperor enlisted the help of his general, who was a ruthless, ruthless man named Shi Le. who will become one of the great, the main characters of this drama unfolding. And, you know, you need to watch out for this guy because he is a badass. If you look at the characters forming his name, even his name means Stone Strangler. You could even say that he was a Stone Cold Killer. Anyway, sorry, excuse the pun. Sheila was very much a product of these warlike and chaotic times. He was a man after the, the model of Conan the Barbarian. His greatest joy was to roam the earth, crushing his enemies, seeing them driven before him, and hearing the lamentation of their women. And he belonged to a unique tribe within the larger Xiongnu group. The modern Chinese name for Shi Le's tribe was Jie. But in ancient Chinese, it had a different pronunciation. The pronunciation of this name was Kyat, uh, or Kyat, or something along those lines. And uh, this tribe was a vassal of the Han Zhao dynasty. Remember these guys who had set themselves up as legitimate. So at any rate, the Jie, they were a very mysterious group that had emerged from the north, and they spoke a completely unique language. And they even used, they are rather, they even had a different physical appearance from their neighbors around them. And so Shi Le, uh, actually come to think of it, in the same vein as Conan the Barbarian, he had been sold into slavery as a boy, but had risen through society by a strong sword arm and martial prowess. And he, his tactic was not to fight like a gentleman, but to charge in, swords drawn, and pillage everything around him. And so, by the means of these savage tactics, he soon became one of the greatest and most feared generals in all of the Han Zhao Empire. In fact, underneath Shi Le, the, the, the ragtag army of badasses, had, uh, that, that formed the, the Han Zhao military, they even conquered most of northern China. And they extended to the Yellow River itself, which, of course, is the ancient heartland of Chinese civilization. So, even, but even this, of course, would not satisfy a man of Shi Le's ambition. He wanted more than that. So, let's find out what he wanted. He wanted to be the emperor of China itself. So, in 319, he took up arms against the Han Zhao emperor and created his own state, created his own state known as the Later Zhao. Han Zhao has lost its best general, so they could not hold out for long, and by 329, Shi Le had conquered the last pockets of Han Zhao resistance and murdered the emperor. And so thus 
was Shi Le made the uncontested ruler of all of North China. And despite he himself being Qiang and not Chinese, the ethnically Chinese Jin Dynasty continued on in the south, but it was really not that much of a threat. And so, in 330, Shi Le declared himself emperor of the later Zhao Dynasty. He declared himself the son of heaven and the ruler of all under it. That is, the emperor of China. But would this dynasty, won by the might of his sword, survive? Stay tuned and find out.